Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. In Iran, Josh Fatal and Shane Bauer, two Americans who wandered, say they wandered into Iran while they were hiking in Iraq, have been convicted of spying and sentenced to eight years in jail. Now joining us to talk about this is Hamid Debashi. Hamid teaches at Columbia University. He's also the author of the book, Brown Skin, White Masks. Thanks for joining us again, Hamid. Thanks, Paul. Anytime. So why, why have they pursued this uh, conviction? Uh, I mean, it's from whatever, whatever evidence it seems, these guys seem to have just been wandering into Iran, as they claim. Why have they made this kind of case out of it? The more, Paul, I learn about uh, these two uh, American and also uh, Sarah Schwartz, who was, uh, was been released on bail, the more I am uh, admiring them, they are progressive uh, uh, people who have been trying to alter the vision of uh, Americans about these uh, regions. But unfortunately, they have been caught in uh, as pawns in a game between American and uh, Islamic Republic uh, respective governments. They have been sentenced to jail, as uh, all the previous cases, by way of uh, creating uh, attention that they can then release it, somehow uh, securing some sort of... Uh, uh, advantages against the, uh, in their negotiations with the Obama administration. They are being used and abused. Uh, they don't mean anything. They, uh, like any number of other Iranians who are being sentenced to uh, long prison uh, terms on uh, uh, non-existent charges. Uh, these two uh, American young men are also subject to the same harassment. Uh, some of the speculation about why this is taking place has to do with infighting within the Iranian regime. Uh, is there anything to this, and what is the state of infighting? The, the state of infighting is very, very serious. As uh, you know, the next uh, parliamentary election is approaching very soon, and there is infighting within the government and within the regime itself. The, uh, the, the tension that existed between the reformists and the uh, conservatives now is being created within the conservative uh, camp. Uh, they don't know what to do, uh, but more importantly, it is the geopolitics of the region that is frightening them. Uh, the events, for example, in Libya has catalytic effect in the in Islamic Republic. There was even a report in Le Monde that Islamic Republic was helping uh, Gaddafi in order to prolong the NATO involvement in uh, Libya to prevent the possibility of the intervention in Syria. Syria is collapsing, which is the major ally of uh, Islamic Republic in the region. Hezbollah is in trouble. So the geopolitics of the region is not to the advantage of the Islamic Republic. And that is not a crisis that they can control, contrary to the Green Movement, that they could crush and send their leaders to a jail and house arrest uh, and so forth. So there are two fronts that the Islamic Republic now faces uh, a crisis. One internally, namely how to manufacture and stage a show of democracy of the next parliamentary election when the leading reformists are actually in jail, and at the same time, how to handle this regional crisis. And these two young Americans have been caught in the, in the crossfire. Now, a lot of the discussion has been about Ahmadinejad and the Supreme Leader, that they've had a falling out and, and that there's a, the struggles taking place at that level. What do you make of that? Ahmadinejad was never a significant political figure. There were some uh, readings of the situation that he represents a younger generation of the, uh, the Pasdaran. Uh, which could be uh, true. But uh, the, for the establishment, for the clerical establishment, for Khomeini in particular, he would dispense with Ahmadinejad any second when it comes to preserving his regime, his absolutist uh, uh, power. Uh, Ahmadinejad was preparing and coaching a man he, uh, he endorses and likes, a man named Mashoi, to, to succeed him as the, as the president. And obviously, the regime is in more serious trouble for him to designate who will succeed him. So uh, the uh, self-preservation machinery of the regime has come back to, uh, uh, to decide who will succeed uh, the president, uh, Ahmadinejad, and in one particular terms. The, uh when, when, during the Green Movement and when the people were in the streets, uh, one of the m most underreported parts of it, I thought, was the extent to which Iranian workers joined in, and particularly Iranian, the Iranian Union Movement. Uh, what is the state of things in terms of the unions and workers' movement now in Iran? 
very much under the control because uh, it, uh, when they succeeded to uh, suppress the green movement, they realized fully well that there are three major grassroots organizations, the first of which is labor unions, independent labor unions. Second and third are women's organizations and student assemblies that they cannot suppress because they are grassroots. Leaders of the unions are in jail. Uh, people like Masoud or San Lu, and uh, they have been appealing to progressive or presumably progressive leaders in Latin America, such as Chavez, writing to Chavez directly detailing their predicament in jail to no, uh, to no avail. Uh, but they remain very strong uh, for very fundamental reasons. The minimum wage is in uh, actually lower than the, uh, than the cost of living. And uh, the, the condition of the labor, uh, 7 million laborers in a population of 72 million times 4, that amounts to 28 million with their families, that is the labor force in, uh, in Iran. Uh, they are under very, very severe circumstances, but they're their, their organizations, their unions, their syndicates is heavily uh, under security control, and the slightest uh, manifestation of protest is severely cracked down. But nevertheless, you have consistent and systematic, but under the radar demonstrations by labor unions across Iran. How, how badly is Iran being affected by the current global economic situation? And if, this, if the global economy sinks into a much deeper recession, which uh, it's certainly looking like it, it's going to... Uh, what will that mean in terms of Iran's politics? Even more uh, severe trouble that they have. As you know, Iranian economy is about 85% oil-based, and uh, oil-based economy is always at the mercy of what is happening in the uh, financial uh, uh, world uh, market. And uh, especially under these circumstances that Ahmadinejad's uh, cabinet has initiated the elimination, they call it uh, making it purposeful, but it's actually elimination of governmental subsidies. And uh, the, no longer this is limited to the labor class and is affecting the whatever exists of the middle class uh, in the aftermath of this elimination of the subsidies. And the slightest fluctuation in the oil revenues will have direct impact on the most vulnerable classes in the society with obvious consequences in terms of social protest. That's what I was going to ask them. Is it possible when we'll see in Iran maybe something like what we've been seeing in Israel, uh, protests that are purely based on economics? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and of course, uh, protests that are based absolutely on, on uh, economics doesn't mean they don't have political consequences. In fact, labor organizations and labor protests uh, in Iran, as in fact in the Arab world, they predate the Green Movement, they predate the rise of the Arab Spring. But because they are not uh, chic and uh, sexy, nobody pays any attention to them. Uh, they have existed and they continue to exist and they continue to demonstrate, but uh, neither the local press nor the international press is interested in it. You have to fish for these in the in the uh, websites of these labor organizations uh, to find out what is happening. Thanks, Thanks for joining us, Simon. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. Yeah, very good, thank you.